Welcome to another Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly show where we get to answer all of your tech related mountain bike questions. You can get those questions to us in the comments below, the email address on the screen via our Instagram page and also via the Facebook page. So send those questions in no matter how big or small and hopefully we will be able to answer them for you. So first up this week is from Andrew Davis and it's talking about tires, in particular 26 inch tires. Can you help me with some tire recommendations? 26 inch going on a Kotic Beefy, so that's a hard tail, um, with 140 millimeters of travel, 23 mil internal rim width. I'm a big fan of Maxxis, but I'm open to anything. All right, so let's just, it's a big subject here. We'll go for three brands. We'll look at Schwalbe, Maxxis, and Continental. So with Schwalbe, I tended to sort of operate between three main tires. So let's just say in split two parts of the year, so the colder and softer conditions, I'd be running a Magic Mary up front, so that's a really aggressive tire, and they make that all the way through to full downhill spec carcass and compound. And again, they can make this a quite a firm compound with the lighter weight carcass, so it does suit where you're gonna be able to ride this thing. Very aggressive tire, that. And then out back, I'd run the hand stamp, which is sort of a midway tire. It's got plenty of grip and traction, quite open spaced. Now, I always used to have that in the sort of the Trail Star equivalent compound, which is now called Speed Grip. So it is soft, but it's also quite fast, so it's not the softest. And then in summer conditions, I would flip that and put that one on the front, and on the rear, I'd go for the Rock Razor. So that's a semi-slick tire with a sort of uh, file tread pattern on the top and big shoulders. So really good for cutting a turn in, but real minimal rolling resistance in a straight line. Big fan of Schwalbe tires, really, really good. Now in the world of Maxxis tires, I'd pretty much, my favorite tire of all time as far as they're concerned is the DHR2. So that's a rear tire, but I used to like running them front and rear purely because my local conditions, it's more about braking than it is about anything else. So we've got some steep trails and we've got some really, really bad mud. And under braking, that tire, I've not found anything that grips as well as that. However, the front tire is also really good, and as a combination, as they're supposed to be, the front and rear, they work excellently. Now you see a lot of riders in bike parks who are out there for the summer, they'll run the, the front tire, front and rear on their bikes, because not only do they roll nice and fast, but they last really well compared to the rear tire, which chews up quite a lot because of the fact it cuts in so well. And if you want a faster rolling tire out back, like the Rock Razor, Maxxis have got their version, which is the Minion Semi-Slick. Very, very similar in casing and design, big shoulders, file tread on the top. And of course, I'm gonna to throw you to Conti. We ride Continental tires here at GMBM. So there's two particular tires I wanna to talk to you about. So firstly, the Trail King. This is a brand new tire now for 2018. So it's always existed in the range. Back in the day, in the original 26 inch model, it used to be called the Rubber Queen, but that now changed to Trail King. Now the, the tread design on it had a slightly unusual shoulder on it previously, it sort of wiggled in and out slightly, but now it's got a really defined and quite a heavy shoulder on that, which is just the thing I look for. Now something unique about these particular tyres is they've got a black chilli compound, which is actually quite soft, but somehow they managed to roll really fast. It's just a bizarre compound, but somehow rolls quick. Now they don't do a semi-slick style tyre, but they do do the Mountain King, and this is their newer tyre. They've always had a Mountain King in their range. This is their third generation of it now. And I can tell I've been running these front and rear at the weekend. I can't believe how fast they are for a tyre with quite substantial grip. Carcass size is only 2.3 on these, and they make these in 29, 27 and half, and 26. As far as I'm concerned, this is gonna be my new rear tyre for most conditions. Love the way it feels. But again, tyres are a personal preference thing. So despite what I've just told you about the recommendations, the best way to find a good tyres for you is ask the other riders in your area what they ride, and you will see a bit of a pattern. You're gonna see some anomalies here and there, but you'll find that most of the tyres will be fairly similar across riders, and you'll know that they're the ones that hook up best. So if in doubt, check with your local bike shop, see what the mechanics ride, see what the local staff ride, or join a group. Next up is a lubricant related question from Kuba Stonowski. Hi Dolly, I'm looking to buy some products for cleaning and lubing my bike. I'm looking to buy a kit from Muckoff. I'm kind of confused about Muckoff MO94. Is it similar to WD40? It's a water dispersant, so uh, can I use it to drive out water from my chain derailleur, etc.? Is it safe to use on my fork, shock, suspension links, bearings, etc., uh, to give it a slight lubing? Thank you. Um, okay, so WD40 and MO94 are both water displacers. So the WD40 is now a water displacer 40, and that's the 40th version of that particular formula it took to get to it. Obviously, that one's got my name on it as a, just a random sticker on the top. It's not a, a can you can buy. 
But the thing with WD-40 is a bit of a specialist thing as well because they don't actually tell you what's in their formula. It's a closely guarded secret. Now we do know it's got lubricant in it. We do know that it freeze seized parts. We do know that it's a water displacer. It's also solvent based, which means you can use it to clean things. So the solvent is actually a vessel for getting the lubricant into items. So you can lubricate stuff, but it will also remove grease from certain places. So you don't really want to spray directly into your bearings. You can spray around your bearings and your pivots as long as you wipe this stuff off but you put too much in there, it is a deep penetrant, so it will get in there. But one of the key things, with, well, in fact, two of the key things with WD-40 over any other ones, is firstly, it's is safe to use around electrical items, so you could use this, uh, the ignition in your car, you could use it in various different places, electrical contact points, and also it's a rust inhibitor. So the MO94, as far as I know, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's not a rust inhibitor, so it is a water displacer and it is a mild lubricant, but, Muckoff also make a, an item called Bike Spray, which is a little bit more similar. So it's also a water displacer, it's also a minor lubricant, and it also is a rust inhibitor. But the thing is, against this, this is far cheaper. So we like using it because it's pretty simple and it's always been in our toolkits. The Muckoff one works great, don't get me wrong, but it is more expensive. However, Muckoff do, I'm very aware of this, make these excellent kits that have got various things in like bike spray, MO94, a wet or a dry lube, cleaning kits, and they're great value for money. So go for it, I think. None of the three products I've just mentioned have silicon in them, so they're not good to use around your fork stanchions, areas like this. What you want for that is a dedicated silicon spray. Now, Muckoff make a silicon spray and WG40 also make a silicon spray. So whichever brand you go for, just make sure that you don't put the solvent-based stuff near your forks or the same with your rear shock. Uh, next up from the MTB scene, I pulled the top cover of my RockShox um, cap off, forgetting what's holding the air in, then boom, the air explodes out. I crack my pants and put the cap back on as fast as I can, pump it back up, would this have stuffed anything? Well, first up, you're pretty lucky not to take your eye out. So when you're working on any sort of suspension product, let's just have a look at this Fox Fork, for example. The valve on the top here, although they're relatively low pressure, you can put, say, 100 pounds in this. So the problem is, if you just undo this top cap without deflating it, that top cap is pressurized, so it's gonna go somewhere. So you're really lucky that it didn't fire out and hit you in the face. Always make sure that you fully deflate the valve until nothing else comes out. There we go, you can even see this one dropping down. And just double check that. And only then should you remove those top caps. In your case, I don't think you've done any problem to it. Just put that there for now. Um, I don't think you've damaged it whatsoever. You probably just scared yourself. So just make sure that the top cap is sufficiently tightened. Make sure that you've let the air out if you are gonna loosen this thing off again and just reinflate and hopefully you'll be good to go. Next up is almost a bit of a correction from AJMR8. Uh, this is, I noticed this in the comments from last week's show where I was talking to Aaron Hold about uh, bigger cassettes and the, the capacity of different derailleur sizes. And he says, um, for the question from Aaron Hold about trying to fit a bigger cassette, I suggest looking at the Wolf Tooth Goat Link. That's a very good point and I'd actually completely forgotten they existed. So um, Adrian's description is, it's a little mech hanger extender which screws onto your original mech hanger, dropping your derailleur two centimeters, allowing you to fit a bigger cassette, no matter if you're running nine, 10 or 11 speed derailleurs. Yeah, it's actually a really, really good product and it's a great workaround. It does save you money if you want to put the bigger cassette on there, but keep your rear derailleur. Now there's a whole bunch of different products on the market for doing hop-ups. So you can put the one-up components extender cassette outer sprocket on to give you the bigger sort of sprocket size. Now they go up to now, up to 52, if they do a 1050 setup basically, and they do a whole bunch of these different things. I'm gonna put a link to their website in the description below. And also for the goat link, which is by Wolf Tooth Components, that's a really nice little extra hop up thing you can get for your bike. And that's the sort of thing I wanna see actually in top mods. So if any of you guys have fitted stuff like this, send them in for top mods and I might read them out on the show. I'd love to see that stuff. Next up is from Martin Frith. I got bike protector, um, which is a water displacer. I got bike, to bike protector on my disc rotors a few weeks back and now they howl like a wookie with a stubbed toe. Yeah, unlucky mate. Like this is one of the worst things that anyone can do. We always recommend when using any sort of lubricant, making sure it can't get anywhere near your disc rotor or your pads because once they're contaminated, they're almost certainly done in for. But there is a little workaround you can do for this. So I made a video in trying to stop disc brake squeaking if this has happened to you. So get yourself some coarse emery paper, 
some rubber nitrile gloves, some disc brake cleaner or some quality isopropyl alcohol, even contact cleaner and spray cans, that is ideal for it. And basically remove your disc rotors from the bike, remove your disc brake pads. Now soak the pads uh, in the isopropyl alcohol, make sure they're fully clean and dry. Then afterwards, scrub them down with the emery paper, then clean them and scrub them again. Now do the same process on the disc using a different sheet of emery paper until it's coarse on there. Refit them back to your bike, then bed them in like you would a fresh set of pads. When you bed brake pads in, what you're looking to do is depositing some of the material from the pads onto the rotor. This is the, like, the crucial bond, and if you don't do this correctly, you end up with a rotor that varies in size, and the pads can vibrate slightly, and that's when the squealing occurs. Obviously, the other type of squealing that you're getting, that you're wookie with the stub toe, that's happening because yours are contaminated. So definitely have a look at that video. It's in the link below, and there's some of it just on the screen while I've been rambling on to you about this. But it's a really good process, and it is worth giving it a try because it does save you a bit of money if it does work. But it doesn't always work, so good luck with that one. Um, another suspension-related question. Seems to get a lot of these at the moment. This one's from Philip Ryman. Hi Doddy, I'm a big guy, 105 kilograms and 190 centimeters, and I feel my fork is too soft and bottoming out too easily, and I can't get a good sag on it. I've got a Fox Rhythm 34, and it says maximum 120 psi, um, but to be able to ride it correctly, I'd have to put in 140 psi. Are there any risks of doing this? Would some volume spacers solve my problem? Um, well, first up, if you go over the 120 psi, you will invalidate your warranty. That means you are on your own if you do that. And I know that people have ridden forks over the recommended pressure, but to be fair, I just would not recommend that. So you're on your own if you do that. Now, as far as volume spacers go, they can change everything. So I've just got a list here from the Fox site. So for a 110 mil fork, the maximum you can fit in there is seven spacers. For a 120, it's six. 130, six. 140, five. 150, five. And 160, four. So the spacers you need are the 10 cc size. Um, you can see them on the screen now. I'm just plugging some into a Fox 34, in fact, into that fork uh, for another video I've done in the past. Now, volume spacers can make a significant difference to the way the fork feels, so I'd definitely try that first. But failing that, if you still can't get them to work and support your body weight the way you want them to, you can also look at an aftermarket coil conversion. If you speak to an independent suspension tuner or your local bike shop, they should be able to recommend someone that can do this service for you. Now, I know of a few people who have done coil conversions that have been quite big chaps, and they've had to do this to get the fork working right, and now they've gone coil on the rear and they swear by it. So it is something I consider doing myself actually in the past, but just haven't got that far to be honest. So please don't over inflate that fork because you could end up breaking the fork, damaging the fork, and then you'll be stuck and it'll cost you a lot of money. So definitely have a look at volume spaces, and if not, contact your nearest sort of Fox support agent to see how they can help you. Wheel size from Andrew Hunter. Still no video on 27 and a half rear and 29 front. <laughs> yeah, um, I was actually chatting to Neil about this this morning because Neil obviously did the 27 and a half versus 29 the other day. And I asked him if he'd actually run that combination because he's got both sets of wheels, they're set up, and I know he's got rotors on both of them now, so he only has to swap the cassette out each time. Um, he is going to try it like as soon as possible because I know he really likes the sort of the battering ability of that bigger front wheel and it really helps him get over the bumps, but the smaller wheel helps keep the bike feeling quite agile and stuff. I'm tempted almost to try it on my Nukeproof Mega 290 because there is enough room to fit a plus size tire in the back but it's also gonna dump the bottom bracket quite low. And on my local trails, I do strike my pedals quite a bit because they're pretty rooty. But that said, I'm pretty keen to give it a try. So I'm gonna hassle Neil to get on with that because he can update with another Geek Edition. So hopefully keep an eye out in the future for that. Uh, next up is a wheel-related question from Vince Lan. Dolly, I wanna know, do J-bended spokes have any difference in performance, durability, and stiffness when compared to straight pull spokes? Okay, so just a, a quick advantages and disadvantages of the two types. Uh, first up, how to identify them. The J-Bend is a spoke that's got a 90 degree bend at the top where it hooks into the hub itself, whereas a straight pull is literally completely straight. They both have threads on the end where they screw onto the nipples that hold them onto the rims. Okay, so first up, J-Bend, the advantages are they're common, you can get them anywhere, which means if you're touring, traveling, or anything like that, and you break some spokes, you're gonna be able to go to any bike shop and get a spoke that will fit your bike. Even if they don't have the length that fits yours, get one that's too long, they'll be able to cut it down, re-thread it, and then you go straight into your bike. So that's a great advantage to have. 
Um, they're obviously cheap because there's so many of them and there are a lot of different variants as well. You can have straight gauge, which are basically the solid ones, really strong and get double butted, triple butted, get titanium ones if you want to go super lightweight and exotic and you can get bladed ones, which you've seen on a lot of aero bikes, in particular road bikes. Uh, they're very strong. You can use them on anything from two cross, three cross, four cross wheels. And if you want to go strange, you could have radial or even snowflake if you're living in the 90s. Um, and of course, the major advantage really is the fact that, again, with the cheapness of them, they also rely on the hub design, the most basic design, and they're cheap because they've just got simple flanges. So in the original days, they, those hubs were sort of spun on a lathe or something like that. And it's a very easy hub to manufacture. So therefore the price can stay down and you can get a very high quality wheel. But always it's down to how the wheel is put together. So you can have a fairly cheap rim, a fairly cheap hub and cheap spokes. And if it's laced up really well, tensioned by an expert, that can be a very strong and durable wheel. It's all down to how it's built. Disadvantages are when you break a spoke, that tends to happen at that sort of join, the sort of the bend. And what that means is to replace the spoke, you can need to remove your cassette or the disc rotor or both depending on where you break them off your bike. No bad thing, but it does mean a bit of an inconvenience if you're on the road doing this. And perhaps they're a little bit heavier in some cases, though I just explained you can get lightweight versions, triple butted or titanium. Again, that puts a price up. Now with straight pull spokes, uh, the obvious thing is that they're very light because there's less of them. They don't have the extra bit that bends around so they can be shorter. So it also means they're easy to replace. So they haven't got that elbow that goes around and into the hub. So you can actually just drop one straight back in again. But the disadvantages are there are lots of different types. Some are threaded at both ends. Some the thread is different to others at the end that goes into the wheel itself with the nipple. Some they're different sizes at the top. So the chances are if you break some out on the road, it's gonna be very hard for you to get the exact one. So we would recommend if you have got them, keeping some spares with you. So really, I don't think there's a massive advantage to either, but I'm quite old school. I like the traditional style layouts, purely for the fact that I've always used them. Next up is a geometry related question, and this is always a favorite for me. So, uh, hi Donny, I'm a big fan of long slack geometry, being a huge fan of Pole, Nikolai, and my current favorite, Mondraker. I'm currently riding a 2016 Santa Cruz Bronson C, the pink one, that's called Kalaximoto, I believe, and they named that. I'm not sure why they named it that colour, even though I know why that colour is called that colour. It's, uh, it's the name for a Spanish drink where they put red wine and Cokes together, kind of like a spritzer, but Spanish style. Well, it might be Portuguese, it might be wrong there, but random one for you. Um, it's the best bike I've ever ridden. I do a lot of trail riding, but also street riding on it, Fabio Wibner style. Wow, so you must be pretty good street rider if you ride like Fabio Wibner. Um, I really want the Mondraker June RR, but with 170mm up front and long slack geometry, I'd be afraid I couldn't do street riding on it. Should I just get the thought out of my head and stick on a Bronson, or should I street ride the slack Mondi? Okay, so firstly, any bike is going to do the job. A dedicated street bike would be the optimal thing, something like that 24 inch wheel inspired bike that Danny McCaskill made famous. Um, but of course, it sounds like you're fairly set on getting something new. You know, you've got your Bronson. So that's absolutely fine for messing around. You see like the 50 to one guys like Josh Lewis and that doing loads of jibbing and street riding and messing around. And in the Fox video, so if you've seen that, there's loads of stuff with Kurt Voris and loads of the other riders doing loads of urban stuff on their bike. So don't let that put you off. However, you're in particular talking about the Mondraker. So the thing that's gonna make it more fun for street, if you have to do it on that sort of bike, would be the shorter chainstay chip. So it comes with two options, 430 or 440. Of course, the shorter the chainstay, the easier it is to pop that front end up for ledge manuals and tricks like that. Now, slackening the front end, that's not gonna make any difference to street riding stuff for you, but where you run your handlebar, so the stem height and the bar rise, that makes the bigger difference. Obviously, the higher you go, the easier it's going to be to pop the front end up and do all those sort of bunny hops, hopping up onto ledges, manuals, that sort of stuff. So you can make, make a bike like that feel good fun for tricks and stuff. I mean, have a look at this video clip of me and Blake riding. I'm riding my Nukeproof Mega 290. It was not set up for riding street in any way. I've got a 38mm high-rise bar on there. My stem's quite high. It's got long chain stays, 450mm really long 515 mil reach, and it's got 29 inch wheels. It couldn't be further from a street riding bike, but it doesn't stop me having a laugh on it. So just kind of prove the point that it doesn't matter what bike you're riding, you can have fun on it. And actually, if it's a bit of a hindrance, that can actually make it more fun because you're actually doing something you're not supposed to be doing on what you're riding. Again, I'm just throwing you to another little clip of me and Blake riding in Whistler, and he's on his feather-like little Scott 
I think it's a Scott Genius, the older model here. And Blake getting up onto a bench. Look at me, monster truck, straight up onto the bench on that nuke proof lot. Basically bunny up straight onto it. No problem at all. Not blaming the bike at all. Just get on with it and do it. Have some fun. And also another little clip of me jibbing here, doing a bit of street just on a little ledge outside the place we're staying in Whistler. It's not the ideal bike for this sort of thing. I'm much rather a hardtail, but it's fun. And it makes it fun because it's a challenge to do it on that bike. So if you want to buy the Mondraker, buy it. If you want to keep the Santa Cruz, great, no problem. Just get out there and ride. That's the only thing that matters. Okay, so that's another Ask GMBN Tech in the bag. If you've got any questions, please fire them into the email address on the screen. Hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, any of those sort of ways. Or of course, add them in the comments below. I love reading all your comments and I'll try and interact with you as much as I can. Although there's so many comments these days, it does become quite tricky. For a couple more great little helpful videos, first up is Master MTB Balance Challenges. That one's right down here, that's with Blake. There's a particularly good little trick in there to do when you pick up bottle off the floor while you're still riding your bike. Great one for improving your balance. And also a good laugh to just do in a sort of urban environment. And for another one on 27 and a half versus 29 inch wheels, it's the Geek Edition where Neil's reporting on the video he made. Um, that's in relation to that 27 and a half inch question earlier. Click right down there. Of course, click on the globe to subscribe. We want more subscribers, we want to make more content for you guys. Brand new content for you every single week and there will be more and more coming each week. As always, if you like the video, give us a thumbs up.